All right, chapter 18 is titled, The Trackers. It was Flora and Bombach who braided Turtle's hair now, sometimes in three strands, sometimes in four, sometimes twined with ribbons, while Turtle read the Wall Street Journal. Listen to this, the newly elected chairman of the board of Westing Paper Products Corporation, Julian R. Eastman, announced from London where he is conferring with European management that earnings from all divisions are expected to double in the next quarter. That's nice, Flora Bombeck said, not understanding a word of it. Turtle gave the order for the day. Listen carefully. As soon as you get to the broker's office, I want you to sell AML, sell SEA, sell MT, and put all the money into WPP, okay? Oh my, that meant selling every stock mentioned in their clues and buying more shares of Westing Paper Products. At a loss of some thousands of dollars. Whatever you say, Alice, you're the smart one. Flora Bombach's hands were gentle. They never hurried or pulled a stray hair. Flora Bombach loved her, she could tell. I like when you call me Alice, Turtle said, but I better not call you Mrs. Bombach anymore because of the bomb scare, you know? Calling her Flora would spoil everything. Maybe I can just call you Mrs. Baba? Why not just Baba? That's exactly what Turtle Alice wanted to hear. Was your daughter Rosalie very smart, Baba? My, no, you're the smartest child child I've ever met, a real businesswoman. Turtle glowed behind the Wall Street Journal. I bet Rosalie baked bread and patched quilts and dumb stuff like that. The dressmaker's sure fingers fumbled over the red ribbons she was weaving into the four-strand braid. Rosalie, Rosalie was an exceptional child. The friendliest, lovingest. Turtle crumpled the newspaper. Let's go. I'm late for school and you've got that big trade to make, but I haven't finished tying the ribbons. Never mind. I like I like them hanging. Turtle felt like the kick felt like kicking somebody, anybody, good and hard. Sandy was not at the door when they left. He was in the apartment, 4D, neatly writing in his patriotic notebook information gathering, gathered on the next air. Bombach, Flora Bombach, maiden name, Flora Miller, age 60, dressmaker. Husband, left her four years ago. Sends no money. She had a retarded daughter, Rosalie, a Mongolian child. Sold bridal shop last year after Rosalie died of pneumonia. Age 19. Spends most of her time at stockbrokers. Westing Connection. Made wedding gown for Violet Westing, which she never got to wear. Sandy turned to a fresh page, propped his feet on the judge's desk, and began to read the data supplied by the private investigator on Otis Amber. He laughed so hard he nearly fell off the, the tilting chair. Haunted by last night's dream, Theo jogged behind his partner halfway to the high school before he uttered breathless. Stop, Doug who? Doug who stopped. Who lives in the apartment next to yours? Crow. Why? Nothing. How come he didn't know why? Because no one ever wonders where a cleaning woman lives, that's why. But he wasn't like that, was he? Still, it meant he must have been a dream. In the dream, the nightmare. Crow had been given a letter. But the only thing he found in his bathroom pocket that morning was a Westing paper hanky. Hey, wait. Doug had started off again. I figured out our clues. Ammonium nitrate. It's used in fertilizers, explosives, and rocket propellants. I knew those clues were a, were a pile of fertilizer, Doug replied, jogging easily. Only one thing mattered. Saturday's big track meet. If he won or came in fast second, he'd have his pick of athletic scholarships. He didn't need the inheritance. Stand still and listen. Theo grabbed Doug by the shoulders and held him flat-footed to the ground. Like it or not, we're partners, and you've got to do your share. Sure, Doug replied. His father was angry, his partner was angry, and a bomber was blowing up Sunset Towers floor by floor. Some game. What do you want me to do? Follow Otis Amber. Held, head, head tilted back, Flora Bumbach squirted drops in her eyes, blinked, and stared again at the moving tape. Oh my, Westing Paper Products had jumped four and a quarter, no, four and a half points. Her eyes must be blurry from the medicine. The dressmaker sat on the edges of her chair, biting her fingernails, waiting for the WPP to cross the board again. There, WPP, $40. Oh my, oh my. This morning, she had paid $35 a share. There it goes again. WPP, $40 and a fourth. Oh my, oh my, oh my. After classes, instead of running around the indoor track, track Doug who jogged out of the gym to the shopping center, six blocks away. There was Otis Amber placing two cake boxes in the compartment of his bike. He picked up a package from the butcher shop and pedaled off, unaware of the sweat-suited figure trotting half a block behind him and went into Sunset Towers to make his deliveries. Hi, Doug. Gonna run the mile under four minutes on Saturday, the doorman asked. Sure hope so. Do me a favor, Sandy. Give a loud whistle when Otis Amber comes out, okay? Chip Tooth Sandy gave such a loud whistle that Otis Amber would have been deafened in the flaps of, an, of the aviator's helmet had not been sung against, snug against her ears. Leaving his bicycle in the parking lot, Otis Amber boarded a bus. 
Doug ran the five uphill miles to the house with the place card. E.J. Plum, attorney. He ran another three uphill miles after the bus that took the delivery boy to the hospital entrance. Doug sank down in the waiting room chair, wiped his face on his sweatshirt, and picked up a magazine. Fascinated by the centerfold picture, he almost missed Otis Amber, who had dashed out of the hospital as though fleeing for his life. Hiding behind parked cars, Doug followed the delivery boy to another bus, ran four steep miles to the stockbroker's office. How is it that all these roads go uphill? From the broker to the high school, and the high school downhill at last, back to Sunset Towers. The exhausted track star leaned against the side of the building, thankful he got, thankful he was not a long-distance runner. I gotcha. Otis Amber poked a skinny finger into Doug's ribs. He, 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 he cackled, handing the startled runner a letter. It's from the lawyer Plum. Says he's, all says all the heirs gotta be at the Westinghouse this Saturday night. Sign here. With his last ounce of energy, he wrote Doug Who Miller on the receipt, then slid down the hall to a weary squat. Some miler. His feet were blistered, his muscles sore, he could barely breathe. He might never run another step in his life. On receiving the notice of the Westinghouse meeting, Judge Ford canceled her remaining appointments and hurried home. Time was running out. Sandy read to her from his notebook. Amber, Otis Joseph Amber, age 62, delivery boy. Fourth grade dropout, IQ 50, lives in the basement of Green's Groceries. A bachelor, no living relatives. Westin Connection, delivered letters from E.J. Plum, attorney, both times. I would have guessed Otis Amber had an IQ of 10 minus, minus 10, Sandy said with a smile. Go on to the next year, the judge replied. Dear, D. Denton Dear, age 25, graduate of UW Med Medical School, first year intern, plastic surgery, parents live in Racine, not theirs. Westing Connection, engaged to Angela Wexler, C. Wexlers, who looks like Sam Westing's daughter, Violet, who was also engaged to be married, but not to a politician, an intern. That's awfully complicated. I know the doorman apologized, but it's the best I could do. Pulaski, Sedell Pulaski, age 15, Edgekin, Education, high school, one year secretary of school, secretary to the president of Schultz Sausages. And taking her first vacation in 25 years, six months saved up time, lived with widow, mother, and two aunts until she moved to Sunset Towers. Walked with a crutch even before she broke her ankle in the second bombing. Now needs two crushes. crutches. She paints them. Westing connection, unknown. We don't have any medical reports on her muscular alignment, Sandy reported. The nurse of Schultz Sausages said she was in perfect help when she left on vacation. Strange, the judge remarked. A suspicious malady, no apparent Westing connection, somehow. Sedell Pulaski did not seem to fit in. Sedell Pulaski clasped, clasped the translated notes to her bosom. My little secret mustn't peek, she said coyly, but the doctor had come to see Angela. The plastic surgeon loosened the tape from the check and peered under the gauze. One graft should do it, but we can't operate until the tissue heals, he said to the intern, then spoke to the patient. Call my secretary for an appointment in two months. He strode out of the room, leaving Dent and Deer to replace the bandage. I don't want plastic surgery, Angela mumbled. It still hurt to talk. Nothing to be frightened of. He's the best when it comes to facial repairs. That's why I brought him in. We'll have to postpone the wedding. We'll have a small informal wedding. Mother wouldn't like that. How about you, Angela? What do you want? He, never, he knew her unspoken answer was, I don't know. The door flew open and slammed against the adjacent wall. Where do you think you're going? Denton pulled Turtle to a halt by the streaming ribbons twisted in her braid. The sign says no visitors. I'm not a visitor. I'm a sister. And get your germy hands off my hair. Denton Deer hurried to seek first aid for the bleeding shin and sent the biggest male nurse on the floor to take care of Turtle. And the same male nurse who chased Otis Amber out of the hospital for sneaking up on a nurse's aide, carrying a, carrying a specimen tray and shouting boom. Turtle had time for one question. Angela, what did you sign on the receipt the first time after position? Person? I changed mine to victim, Sidel said. Turtle paid no attention to the victim. She was more interested in the two men entering the room. The burly male nurse and that creep of a lawyer plum. I gotta go. Don't say anything to anybody about anything. Angela, no matter what happens. Not even to a lawyer. You know nothing. You hear? Nothing. She skirted at Plum, ducked under the outstretched hairy hands of the male nurse, slid down the hall, scampered down the stairs, and out of the hospital. Hi, how are you? Ed Plum smiled at Angela, ignoring the patient in the other bed. He didn't recognize Miss Pulaski without her painted crutch. I'm sorry to hear about your accident. Otis Amber told me about it. Just thought I'd drop in for a chat. The young lawyer who had admired the pretty heiress from the minute he first laid eyes on eyes in her did not have a chance to chat. Grace Wexler entered the room saw the answer to the clues. Ed Purplefruit, the murderer, standing over the daughter and uttered a blood-curling shriek. 
three visitors in one day. The first was Otis Amber with a letter and another receipt to sign. Chris had pretended to be scared by the boom, but he really wasn't. He had twitched because he was excited about going to the Westing house again, even if he hadn't figured out the clues. Then Flora Bombach came to see him. He wasn't nervous at all with the nice lady. She smiles that funny smile because she's sad inside. She once had a daughter named Rosalie. She told him how Rosalie would sit in the shop and say hello to the customers and how she would feel the fabrics. Mrs. Bombach made wedding dresses, which are mostly white, so she bought samples of materials with bright colors and patterns because Rosalie loved the colors best. Rosalie had 573 different swatches in her collection before she died. Mrs. Bombach said her daughter might have been an artist if things had turned out differently. What could have I, what could I, what would I have been if things had turned out differently? The third visitor entered, limping. Her partner was limping. Too much excitement, his stupid body was jerking all over the place. Dent and Deer sat, sat down next to the wheelchair. Take it easy, Chris. Calm down, kid. I'm not the creature from the Black Lagoon, you know. His partner and doctor watched horror movies on television, too. Slowly, arms untangled, legs unsnarled. Slowly, Chris stuttered out of his stuttered out his news. Flora Bombuck felt so guilty about seeing their dropped clue that she told him one of her clues, mountain, but we mustn't tell Turtle. Don't worry, the intern said, displaying a bruise in. Chris laughed and sobbed. I, I sorry. Mountain, hmm. Dutton Deer thought about the new clue. If a treasure is hidden in a grain shed on a mountain plain, I sure don't know how, don't have time to look for it, do you? Hmm. Let's forget the clues. I have something more important to tell you. Don't get excited, okay? Chris nodded. His partner was going to ask for money. Denton Deer stood. I'll get your toothbrush and pajamas and we'll go to the hospital. Don't get excited. Chris got excited. How could he explain that he wanted from his partner was companionship, not more probing, pricking doctors with their bad news that just made his mother cry. Listen, Chris, can you hear me? Just overnight, I found a neurologist, a nerve doctor who works on problems like yours. Oprasm? Oprasm? No operation, did you hear me, Chris? No operation. The doctor thinks a new medicine may help, but he has to examine you and make some tests. I have your parents' permission, but no one will touch you unless we talk it over first. You and me, together, I promise. Chris grimaced, trying to smile. His partner said talk it over the two of them together. They were really partners now. You can have m money? What, oh, the money? Later, here, let me take those. You won't need them in the hospital. Chris clung to his binoculars. Well, I guess you do need them. Ready? Here we go. All of a sudden, he was leaving since the towers, pushed by his limping partner. Maybe Denton Deer is not who and what he says he is. Maybe he's being kidnapped for ransom. Maybe he's being held hostage. Oh boy, he hasn't had so much fun in years. And that is the end of chapter 18.